Уже записать. My name is Josh Lang. Uh, I'm here to give a presentation about ethics. Uh, before, we, before we start, though, I want you to think about this question for yourself. Five minutes, and I have an interactive style, so I'll expect you to uh, be involved in the presentation during the presentation. If you have any questions, I would prefer that you ask them at the end. There will be time for that, but if you have a burning question, you can just raise your hand, and uh, I may call on you uh, during the presentation. Okay? Uh, if so, who's ready to become a professional in here? Okay, good. A, a, a good. a good percentage of you. Well, most of you will plan to go to professional schools beyond your bachelor's degree. Yes, yes, I know. That's more work, but this is what we do. We usually specialize with a master's degree or a professional doctorate. And um, a lot of you will become professional economists, hopefully, or uh, politicians or, or what have you, or if it's my class um, in, in the maths and physics and engineering. Let's look at, well, look at this guy here. This is Baron Karl, Baron Karl Theodor to Gutenberg. He's a German. That's his, uh, the name Baron means something and Sue means something as well. Does this guy look professional? Yeah, no. Seems like. Important, yeah? He seems, a, he seems a professional, doesn't he? What do you think? He's on carrier. Usually only professionals work on carrier. Well, I mean, is he working on that, or is he kind of seem more like a, an important figure leading something? He looks like some kind of leader, doesn't he? All right, well, let's look to see if, if he fits the definition of professional based on what we can see. Well, Oxford English Dictionary. I am an English teacher, so I have to throw a little bit of English in here. Uh, declaring, affirming, or avowing an opinion, belief, or custom. Okay, so it looks like maybe he's part of the military, so probably fits that definition. Professes publicly one's faith in or allegiance to a religion, principle, or belief. Yeah, in order to be in a political position or anything like that, you usually have to uh, profess that publicly. Requires advanced knowledge or training in some branch of learning or science. I think he definitely fits that according to the picture. Well, let's see. Who is Carl Theodor to Gutenberg? <clears throat> He's the youngest defense minister ever in Germany. He got the post when he was 38 years old. Right now he's 39 years old. So Germany obviously has a very big military, very important country militarily. So he's a defense minister. Yeah, he, his name, Carl, Carl uh, Theodor uh, zu Gutenberg, Baron, means that he's very rich, that he comes from a very important, rich family in Germany that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, a very respected family. It's like he could probably tell you the names of his last seven grandfathers. I know many of you can do that. Wait, all of you should be able to do that. Okay, and second, he's the next in line for the chancellor position. A chancellor, does anybody know the name of the chancellor currently in Germany? <laughs> wow, you guys know a lot about politics. Great, okay. So, he, that's the highest position in Germany. Well, so let's think about some collocations that go with professional when we think about Baron zu Gutenberg. Well, here's some collocations. I know that you're learning, hopefully you're learning these in your vocabulary class. To be a professional, to act professional, to consult with a professional, to take advice from a professional, to look professional. Does he fit any of these categories? Yeah. 
professional. He looks professional. He looks professional. He is professional. He is professional. Okay. Extremely skilled professional. You think that he's probably skilled? Yeah. Hey, he's the youngest one. He's the youngest guy in the highest position. Probably quite skilled, highly regarded. Yes, yes. All right. So we got some qualifications of Finland. Well, wait a second there. Let's take a let's take a look at another picture of Carl Sue Gutenberg. <laughs> He's not so happy there, is he? What happened? You guys know. <laughs> May 2011. Dr. Doctor, doctor. Now he's no longer doctor. He's no longer doctor because he plagiarized on his doctoral degree at the University of Bayreuth. <laughs> Fifteen years ago. But nobody paid attention until he was in a position of power. And then people started to look carefully. What you do now will have an effect on you in 15 years or later. Now we call him, in Germany, they call him Dr. Gugelberg. <laughs> and the minister of copy and paste. <laughs> Plagiarism! <laughs> but this is an, important, this is an important, uh, important lesson because he comes from one of the oldest, most respected families in Germany. So for his name, Gutenberg, to be changed to Gugelberg is quite, quite significant. Alright, so he's no longer the doctor, he lost his job. And this, most of you will want to go to Harvard or MIT or Cambridge or UCL, hopefully, uh, for, your, for your master's degree because you want to be the best and the top in the country, right? You all want to have powerful positions and tell people what to do. Alright, well to get into these you have to um, make a personal statement personal statements, uh, they look for these things. This is the top 20 schools, top 20 professional schools in the world. This is what they look for. And what we see here is we see, yeah, we see some normal things, writing skills. Um, so be nice to your writing teacher. And all these other things. But we see some down here, maturity, worth six, values, integrity, character. That's 15. That's, that, with maturity, values, and character, is just as much as your commitment to the field. That's hugely important. Why? Because if we're going to put you in the position of uh, chancellor or defense minister or any other uh, high-level position, we need to know that you are trustworthy. All right. So that's what uh, that's what we're going to talk about today: values, character, integrity, and maturity, and the different methods of philosophy, the different ideas in philosophy that actually support these. Because what you you might think that these things values, integrity, and so forth uh, are centered. I know what values is, but the way that you look at values may be different and is different, I would argue, vastly different than the way somebody else looks at values. So speaking about values and character, I have a little sign-in sheet here. And uh, 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 Dr. Smart, thank you very much for inviting me uh, today to lecture. Dr. Smart has given this to me and said that each of you have to put your name on here your name and number on here first. So this is a test of your character. Make sure you put your name, not somebody else's. So pass that around. If Obviously, if you're in my class, your name's not on the list. So give it to the people in the first row there. Yeah. So if you're in my class, obviously, your name's not on the list. This is only for the ARM people. All right, so but moving on. Um, we've already defined the professional, I think. And we've seen an uh, example in politics, which I think most of you are are studying, or all of you. And um, now let's move on to why thinking about right and wrong is necessary in the science and professions. Okay, then we will have some uh, different dilemmas, and I'll ask you to engage in these, in, these, in these dilemmas. Okay? Well, first let me move to the sciences. Charles Darwin said of all the differences between man and the lower animals, interesting choice of phrase, the moral sense or conscience is by far the most important. It is the most noble of all the attributes of man, leading him without a moment's hesitation to risk his life for that of a fellow creature or to sacrifice it in some great cause. So when we're talking about ethics, we're talking about what? Moral. Morality. And what does morality refer to? Something country. Like, uh, only human have 
Only humans have it, that's what he's saying. If, when we talk about morality, we're really talking about good and, and bad. How do we define good and bad? And obviously Charles Darwin, who's the key scientist in the last 400 years, I would argue, uh, has, has found morals to be one of the important differences, a moral conscious, one of the important differences between man and the animals. So why are ethics important? Well, firstly, human beings live in a web of moral relationships. You can't escape it. Your friends, you're always dealing with issues with your friends. You're always dealing with issues with your parents and your family. You're always different, dealing with political issues in the broader community. And you're always going to be dealing with issues in your profession when you um, get to the level of profession. So we live in moral relationships. It's, it's something you can't really escape. This is a real important principle, guys. The consequence of moral positions and rules can be actual suffering or happiness. So if you do something wrong, somebody, there's somebody's gonna suffer because of it. It might not be you. For example, you might just be trying to make an investment. I'm I'm making an investment in this thing called a derivative. And this derivative is going to make me money, and that's it. But guess what? A lot of people thinking like that created the financial meltdown of 2008, and which is continuing into today, and so uh, would argue it's a systematic problem. But likewise, if you do something good for somebody, if you do something right, I'm sorry? You could be, yeah, you'll be praised by, not only by society, for the good works that you do and things. But also, it, it, you're praised because it has good consequences. So whatever you do, whether it's plagiarism on a doctoral degree exam or it's helping out your friend in, when, when your friend is in need, these are going to have consequences in real life. They're not, these are not just philosophical concepts we're talking today. These are very real examples and very real implications of these examples. And lastly, moral conflicts are frequently inevitable and difficult. All right, so if you have a, a friend, um, let's say your friend, or no, let's go even closer. Let's say your brother or sister needs an operation, a medical operation, okay? But let's say your brother or sister has a gambling problem too, and they used to be rich, they had a good job. Well, guess what? They spent all their money on gambling, threw it away, and now they need an operation. Who, you're the only brother or sister, should you pay for it? Yes. Yes, okay. Some people would say yes. Some might say, well, why should I pay for it? Who will pay? Maybe the, some people would say the state should pay. That's the key word. Who should pay? Because whenever we use the word should, we're usually talking about morals. But it's a difficult thing. Yeah? Should I tell on my friend who's cheating right next to me? No. Well, no. But if they if, sure. if he's cheating on if he's if he's looking at my exam and the invigilator, you guys know how UCL invigilates. I mean, we are like military. <laughs> you were just in a test, I'm sure. Well, if, if the invigilator catches us, we're both caught cheating. So sh should I help my friend? Yes. Or should I move? No, should I tell the invigilator? <coughs> it's not fair. What's not fair? You should cover it's yourself and not letting him cheat from you. You should cover yourself. It's not fair. You should help your friend. These are difficult dilemmas that, you, that happen constantly. And you can't get away from them. You can't escape. All right, so that's why, according to Bach, uh, Callahan and Bach, that uh, this, uh, and this guy, Engelhart, made a great um, distinction, a categorization of the different levels of belief that we have. Firstly, there's personal beliefs. Your personal beliefs might differ from your community beliefs. Like, for example, in the, in the example that I just gave, what should you do if your brother needs an operation? Well, my personal belief is that no, he wasted his money, now he has to face his own consequences. 
But my community might say, no, you must always take care of your brother. You can't do that. Um, and then we have, you, for example, a great example of this is, is the, the Muslim religion um, in, the, in the sense of the Sharia law. Uh, the, the certain there are certain community beliefs that might contradict what you feel is right. All right? And this happens in all religions. All right? So you have a, this difference between the personal beliefs and the community beliefs. This also includes your parents. Does everybody agree with 100% of what their parents tell them? No. You should do this. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. Do you agree with it? No. Sometimes. Okay. If you agree 100%, you're unusual. So you have these two separations. But then you have all these different people, millions and billions of people in the world, all these different communities, thousands upon millions of different communities that have all their own beliefs. So what do we do? When we have globalization, when we have large organizations like universities that need to need to um, work with several different interested parties, what we call stakeholders, what do we do? Well, we have to have moral principles and rules that guide our thinking and that can integrate these different things. Does it sound easy? <laughs> it's not easy. So, let's, let's, let's move on to a, a real dilemma now that really happened. Okay, this is, again, referring back to science and then we'll move on to economics uh, for the later, uh, the later example. Take a, take a look at this information. Can everybody read this in the back? <laughs> so basically, very famous Korean scientist, Dr. Huang, very successful in getting money from the government and from private organizations. Yeah, I think he's successful. He published a paper in a major international journal suggesting that they took, extracted this DNA from these 11 different samples, which would make it a good sample. Of, uh, and a very good sample in the, in the field of genetics. He claimed that this technique could be the key to providing uh, personalized cures. <coughs> Public recognition would bring Dr. Wang and his team additional money, equipment from more <coughs> sponsors. <coughs> what would you do if you were Dr. Wang? I'd be happy. But he lied. He he took he said he told everybody it was eleven samples, but it was really only two. That was the second point there. But he decided to take a little risk. Yeah? Well, it's really hard for them to really identify whether it was two samples or eleven samples. So I'll just say it's eleven, and everybody will believe me because I'm, I'm Dr. Wang. <laughs> And then we'll get more money, and then we can really do the research. But without the, without the money, we can't do the research, so if I tell the truth, I won't get the money, I can't do the research. So his logic was thinking, if I do something small bad now, will be a greater good later. What would you do? The same thing. She would find a different method. Let's find out what happened to Dr. Plain. He was caught, and his team was caught. Seoul National University panel said the research by world-renowned Wang Wu Suk was intentionally fabricated. Intentionally fabricated. And this is what the Commission of Science said. This is a serious wrongdoing that has damaged the foundation of science. Science is all about getting the wrong answer until you get it right. If it's not getting the wrong answer, it's not science. He's damaged it. Just a small risk with big implications. A symbol of apology, I stepped down as professor of Seoul National University from hero to zero. 
He was admitted to hospital earlier this month, that was in 2005, suffering from stress. So now we're looking at implications not only to the broader society, but we're also looking at personal and professional implications for unethical behavior. All right, so we look at that. We looked at a couple of examples. We all know what we're talking about here today. Let's move on to the philosophy because some people have a philosophy that says, well, a little bad now, a greater good later. We'll call that utilitarianism. And that was started at UCL. Uh, but other people say, if it's bad, it's always bad. Okay? And that's what we would call rational, rational theory. So we're going to look at some of these different theories that uh, underpin um, ethical behavior and see where you might see where you fit in uh, to these theories, okay? The first response is one we already talked about. Uh, it's a response that's most uh, popular, popularly characterized by uh, Aristotle. And he said nature does nothing in vain. Basically, he said that uh, there, he, his position was that you have these character dispositions or you, these moral dispositions, personality dispositions that come from your parents. And basically, um, these come from your parents. And when you're a small child, for example, what Aristophanes said, um, that it's set basically by your immediate environment. So the way that you react in a situation is set. And he said that the best thing to do is to be a balance. So what he called, for example, um, courage. He said courage. Does everybody know that word courage? Yeah. He said that, well, courage... On, on one extreme, you have brazenness, just someone who's completely bold and doesn't care about any consequences. You know anybody like that? Okay. And then on the other hand, you have um, lack of courage, complete lack of courage, or cowardice, what Aristotle called cowardice. So either a person's a complete coward or a total crazy person, but what Aristotle said is that virtue, character, is in the middle. Golden. The mean, the golden mean. Excellent. And the, and the golden mean is what you want to try and find in any situation. But basically they said that this is pretty organized in yourself by the 87. Alright? Values, character, integrity, maturity. Well, Aristotle had a pretty clear definition of what these are based on your disposition, but um, other people have different definitions. All right, for example, religious school of thought, dating back uh, uh, as far as man has had a moral conscience, I've, I've broken these down uh, into two main areas of thinking. One is a God who judges right and wrong in the afterlife based on written or spoken rules. This is basically in an Abrahamic tradition where you have the Muslims, uh, the Christians, and the Jews. And this is where you think that after I die, there's going to be a God that judges my actions right or wrong. If I was a good little boy, then Santa Claus is going to come and bring me presents. If I was a bad little boy, then Santa Claus is going to um, uh, chop my head off and throw me in hell. <laughs> All right. And then there's another religious tradition that comes from the Hindu Buddhist uh, school of philosophy. And they say reincarnation. Uh, does anybody know what reincarnation is? Yes. yes. Okay. Wow, you guys are really good with vocabulary. All right, um, reincarnation until right and wrong become one. So basically, you die, everybody makes mistakes, right? Yes. Well, you, you, and the, this, this way of thinking goes, well, you make mistakes in this life, you learn from your mistakes, hopefully. Uh, and then the next life, you make less mistakes and less mistakes and less mistakes until there's no distinction between right and wrong, until you're free from right and wrong. And then you become in a state of, does anybody know? Woo, Nirvana, that's really good, guys. You guys already know this stuff. All right, so let's look at an example of these, of how the, the differences, even in the religious schools of thought, are massive. Lex Stallion's principle, direct, retrib direct retribution. Moses, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Yeah, you steal from me, I steal from you. Yeah, you touch my... Uh, uh, face and I hit you five times in the face. Alright? This is a classic. But then Jesus comes along and throws that up in the air. 
2,000 years ago and says, You've heard an eye for an eye, but I tell you, do not resist evildoers. <laughs> Don't hit them back. Because he argued later in that same passage in, in the book of Matthew that if you hit them back, that'll only give them more reasons to hit you more. And this was in the context of the Roman imperial rule, so the Romans were looking for excuses to, to beat people up. Oh, you hit me back? Okay. Alright, then we come back to Muhammad, 500 years or more after Jesus. And he comes back to the Les Talionis, and he, but he, he clarifies Moses, because eye for an eye, tooth for tooth is quite, quite specific, but Muhammad, uh, may rest in peace, says equivalent injury for an injury, alright? And that's kind of where we get the idea. It's based on, basically it's based on Roman, the Roman law, which says, well, you can't really take a person's eye out. Why don't we, if the person's rich, why don't we just charge him some money? Or make him go to prison. Alright? And that seems like a much more just uh, way of doing things. However, this is taken quite literally in some Muslim cultures, isn't it? Yeah? But then, 20th century comes along, and a, a, a very famous Hindu person, who there's a quote, there's a quote from him in your library. Does anybody know who that is? Muhammad Gandhi. Muhammad Gandhi, right. He comes and says, like Stalionis, if we follow the old rule, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, the world would be blind. Because we all do injury to each other. Don't we? I thought that was a pretty good one. So, so even within the religious tra tradition, there's a lot of contrast. But there is also a quote, in order for evil to prevail, <coughs> prevail good people need to do nothing. Okay, that's another good quote. For evil to, pre to prevail, good people need to do nothing. And that uh, links right in with the idea of reasoning and duty. For, this again was back in the Greek days. Um, Plato argued that there was these things called forms, and forms create these ideas. And so there's an absolute universal right and an absolute universal wrong. And we just kind of play out these lives based on this absolute right or wrong. And the other school of thought during the Greek days uh, um, were the sophists, and they said, no, 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 Moral, morality is only related to man, so man is the measure of right and wrong. It's nothing to do with these outside forms that exist in the universe. And so they've been arguing that uh, thousands of years ago, but more recently a man named uh, Immanuel Kant uh, in Königsberg, uh, Germany, uh, who was a very, he's a very significant philosopher, and he said that he created this thing called basically what he called the categorical imperative, which basically means all stealing is bad. If stealing is bad, it's bad in every case. It must be. And he's got a very strong argument for this, all right, a philosophical argument for this, and it's still used today for this idea that reasoning is where we make our moral decisions. We actually think about our moral decisions as they're right or wrong. All right? Good enough for a basic introduction. Uh, in contrast, there's more recent thinkers who suggest that the consequences, again, the good and the bad, a little risk now, a lot better later. If I only do the small thing wrong now, it'll create greater good. The most good for the most people. I'm sure that you've probably heard about uh, Thomas Hobbes. Or Gautier, egoism. Basically, this is the idea of self-interest. Well, if we're all self-interested, then what we're going to do is we're going to get together and make a social contract. Hey, you don't punch me in the face, I won't punch you in the face. Let's be friends. And then the world just will work peacefully. And then we can have a free market and there won't be any problems with the market, right? We don't need, uh, uh, we don't need any other uh, economics besides Adam Smith. So basically, this says that self-interest, by acting on your self-interest, which you will do anyway, that's where morality can uh, be best situated. Another school of thought, again, thinking about consequences. This also has led to modern human rights theory as well. Uh, altruism, this is uh, Augusta Comte, he's also the founder of the, uh, positivism. He said that we're morally obliged to benefit others. Okay, So he's been situated in the consequentialist movement. And then utilitarianism, again, I mentioned this earlier, Jeremy Bentham, um, 
was uh, associated with uh, UCL in the early days. Uh, and you'll see that in a minute. And he says basically this idea that you always have to weigh the good and the bad. So he assumed that the good and the bad can always be weighed. He assumed that good and bad are measurable constructs. Okay? And uh, 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 Del Stewart Mill adapted that a, a, a bit. So basically this is where you get uh, in, financial, in the financial theory cost-benefit analysis. Has anybody heard of cost-benefit analysis? Well, if you're going to be an econ e economist, you should, you should get to know some finance terms as well. All right? So that's consequentialism. Oh, and here's, here's Jeremy Bentham right here. He likes to spend time in, in, the, in the UCL library. And there's uh, obviously Sarah Felix there with a glass of tea. Um, and uh, that's actually in the UCL library in London. So if you go to London, make sure you ask to go see the, uh, the library. And in the library, you'll see the Jeremy Bentham room. That's his real body. That's his real dead body, yeah. It's, it's a different head, it's a plastic head, because people were used to steal the head. But, uh, that's not funny. But uh, anyway, uh, why is his dead body sitting in UCL library? It's simple. It's simple. Somebody challenged Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy, somebody challenged Jeremy Bentham. He said, what use can be a dead body? So, we can, so they're challenging him on this cost benefit. What are the benefits of a dead body? And, uh, and Jeremy Bentham, well, I'll give you a good example. My dead body can be exhumed and used to inspire people to think critically and challenge the status quo in future generations. And guess what? It's so simple. His body is now being used, so there is some benefit to the dead body. Alright? And Sarah obviously recognizes that with her teeth. <laughs> Another school of thought, and I just got a couple more and then we'll move on to our last example, is emotions. Yeah? What's right? I feel what is right. I know what is right because I know. <laughs> I feel. Alright? But this has a philosophical, this has a philosophical background as well. David Hume, 1748, Scottish philosopher, says reason is a slave of the passions. So he contrasts Kant quite directly to say, I mean, where Kant says, you know, you think through things and then you act, whereas David Hume says, no, 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 no. Uh, you can't really say what is good or bad by any rational means. It always comes down at the end to a feeling, to a sentiment, all right? And he used the idea of the spectator. Again, he's famous for um, the idea of uh, his, his philosophy, empirical philosophy. And so what we see is these moral philosophies are something, uh, are part of a greater philosophy, all right? We're just scraping the surface today, guys. All right? And then Freud, he, uh, Sigmund Freud came along and talked about these things called complexes, which are mental, uh, both conscious and unconscious. Uh, drives and these things actually drive your behavior. Uh, it's, it's it's quite complex, but basically he's saying that these come from your feelings uh, in the emotional realm. You can't separate the emotions from your conscious behavior. So obviously we think in the conscious, but we also think behind the conscious. And Freud used many and his followers in the psychoanalysis, the school of psychoanalysis use many demonstrations to show that we act a lot, but we don't really realize uh, why we act, which is behind the conscious or unconscious. All right, so we have another school of thought that relate, relates to emotions. And then finally, oh yeah, I forgot about this one. Nail Noddings came up with a theory of education about the concept of natural caring. So she's saying that what is right is care. We should judge what's right or wrong based on how much we care. And this is the basis of her, of her idea that the longing for goodness, that we want to be good, it comes from our memories. She um, has been um, described as feminist because what she said is these other moral theories, Hume, Kant, virtue, ethics, these other theories are all masculine. They come from this masculine kind of, I'm right and you're wrong, but they don't seek consensus, which is like a mother or what a what a woman might be more centered to do. So she's a, 
a very famous um, female uh, philosopher that said, well, wait a second. Reality has two sides, let's say. A masculine and a feminine. Why do we favor the masculine so much more than the feminine? We all have a mother. It's our memory of being cared for which makes us want to care. Sounds pretty logical. I mean, there's lots of problems with it. But again, and then um, I think you might have studied Martha Nussbaum a little bit. She's not a major philosopher, but she's a great critical theorist. She's argued with uh, some, of the, some of the really the smartest people, and she says, well, wait a second. All these things are wrong. We can't really look at masculine or feminine or justice and injustice until we really identify the power relations that are involved in there. She's saying, she's suggesting that it's a social hierarchy that is creating these divisions of morality. Yeah, it's based on this idea of the bourgeoisie. Okay? And that will be all for those. But a, a nice rounding off statement for, for all of these different theories is that every moral action must meet the test of publicity. If you do something wrong, if you do something right, it's always going to have to be seen by others, and the others are going to have to say, yes, that was okay, or no, that wasn't okay. And uh, we try and make these as clear as possible in the, in the secular world of large organizations. All right, so now we've gone to, through all this stuff. Let's now talk about economics, which I'm sure you're all really excited. I'm going to put you in this dilemma. You're an economist, high level. You're paid to write a positive report about a specific country's condition and future security. However, your mathematics, you've changed a couple things in your mathematics maybe. Whoop, whoop, it's very easy. If everything continues as normal, nobody will discover that you reported incorrect data. What are you going to do? <coughs> You're getting paid to do something. Are you going to do it? That, what, that's, right. that's wrong because basically you will be discovered that the situation is insecure and giving a positive response will bring like uh, create even more insecurity having the bad foundation. Well, what if you're not caught? Even if you're not caught, those who will invest will lose money, most likely to lose money. So you're thinking about the investors, the consequences to the investors. We have a bad one economy collapse that went throughout the whole world. For example, okay, so you're thinking about the consequences. Yes. Okay, does anybody have a different response? We can be open here. <laughs> Nobody's judging you. You can, you can say, I'll do it. I would do it, man. They're paying me a lot of money. I would do it. And that would be uh, more towards the self interest well, School of thought. Is, economist, you already have a, quite a good income. Yeah, and you've heard it. It's more about greed than like survival. survival. It's more about greed than survival, he says, because as an economist, you already have quite a good income. Well, let's take a look at this video of a man. Who was in this situation? He's a senior professor at Columbia Business School, so don't believe everything you hear about authority when you have your evaluated sources text. You have to look at the text. Who cares if he's a professor at such and such? All right? Yeah, I said that. All right, he was the governor of the U.S. Treasury at the time of this video, or at the time that he wrote this report. He wrote a report supporting Iceland's economy. He was paid this much money. I want you to look at these questions. Stability or instability? And this other one, are there, is there a typo on his, a typing error on his CV? Let's take a look at Mr. Mishkin. In 2006, you co-authored a study of Iceland's financial system. Right. Iceland is also an advanced country with excellent institutions, low corruption, rule of law. The economy has already adjusted to financial liberalization, while prudential regulation and supervision is generally quite strong. Yeah, and that was the mistake. It turns out that, uh, that the prudential regulation and supervision was not strong in Iceland. And particularly so what did you period, think that it was? 
I think that uh, you're going with the information you had, and, and generally uh, the view was that, that, uh, that Iceland had very good institutions. It was a very advanced country. Who and they were not, who did, what kind of well, research did you do? You, you talk to people, you have faith in, in uh, the central bank, which actually did fall down on the job. Uh, that uh, clearly it, this... Um, Why do you have faith in a central bank? Well, that faith, you, you, because you go with the information you have. How much were you paid to write it? I was paid, uh, I think the number was, uh, it's public information. Uh, under CV, the title of this report has been changed from financial stability in Iceland to financial instability in Iceland. Uh, well, I don't know, whichever it is, is the other thing, if, if it's a typo, it's a typo. I think what should be publicly available is whenever anybody does research on a topic that they disclose if they have any financial conflict with that research. But if I recall, there is no policy to that effect. I can't imagine anybody not doing that in terms of putting it in a paper. You would, it would be significant professional sanction if you were to do that. I didn't see any place in the study where you indicated that you had been paid uh, by the Icelandic Chamber of Commerce to produce it. Um, I don't, I don't, no. Okay. All right. So what do we got here? Uh, in, this. in Iceland, to financial instability in Iceland. Um, well, I don't know. Which whatever it is, is the other thing. If, if it's a typo, there's. Uh, if it's a typo, there's a typo. Okay. Stability or instability in Iceland? Stability. Instability. Stability. We don't know. The actual was instability, but he wrote stability. He wrote stability, but the actual was instability. And what did he write on his CV to cover himself up? Typing error. A, 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 a typing error. Sure. But now it's on YouTube. Millions of people can see it. Anybody can see it. Especially those students at Columbia Business School where he works. I would be embarrassed. Alright, so basically we see you have a personal belief system which might be self-interest or might not, might be altruistic. You have your community beliefs which is again where you come from. Obviously in America we like capitalism so uh, the, you know, the community that I come from is more centered on the kind of thinking that uh, Mr. Mishkin does. And then uh, you have a larger frame of reference uh, in the world. And you've got to balance these um, in any, no matter which philosophy that you adhere to. Okay? Why are ethics important? Because if something seems black and white, it might not be. It might be actually a little bit more gray and convoluted than you believe, than you think. All right, now we're back to the personal statements. All right, here's some examples of unethical conduct from university students. Oh, not me. Plagiarism. Paying other people to complete coursework. Falsifying data on research projects and labs. Copying from other people on tests. Lying to your tutor or teacher, downloading illegally from the internet. You know, one last dilemma. This is a dilemma for you. Well, that's what uh, this guy says. You know, but communism doesn't seem to work very well. Uh, I can't tell you, oh, you do this or I'll kill you. I can't do that. This is what we do. If you plagiarize on a test or you're caught cheating, 0%, we catch you. But if you're not caught, you get out of there. So let's put you in a real, a real situation. Okay, so we know that there's future implications, future and present implications. Put yourself in this situation. Yes. 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 <laughs> Those of you who said yes, that's fine, I respect that. But think about where you're getting the essays. You're getting the essays from students at the University of Cambridge. 
together. But yet you are sitting here and saying, we're going to be the top university in Kazakhstan. We're going to be world-class students. Yet you're, you're, some of you are saying that you will get your essays from students at Cambridge. How can you ever match Cambridge when you are taking their work and copying it? Anybody have a response? Not copying. I'm taking the work. I don't need to do the research. I have a ready paper. I just rework it, putting in my own way, and I submit it. And I've done some work, not the work they were expecting me to do, but I've done the work, and I will be passed because I didn't plagiarize. And what's going to happen in 10 years when you're given a contract to write an economic report, and, they, and you need to know some certain mathematics, some certain skills, some certain uh, knowledge that you're learning a lot of these on your ARM course, by the way. You're going to need some of these skills, subject-specific knowledge, but oh, I don't know. Or what if, you're, what, if, what if you're a doctor and you plagiarized or you've got this, let's say you've got somebody from Cambridge to write your, do, um, uh, um, your medical doctor um, paper, and then you're in a situation where there's a patient that could live or die based on your knowledge of how to save this person's life. But in that class, you just reworked that person's paper. You didn't really do it yourself. So what will happen? to that person who's dying on the table at that moment. I don't know. Depends how good you are rewarding the paper. Okay. Because if you were like, the detailed way, you have all the information in your mind. Okay. You just don't need to find it. You have it in one piece. It's not the same as you begin your research from zero. Okay. Um, yes. and this work of that student will influence to your perception of Following information. And you will also lack uh, research skills. So you could use it as a source? No, uh, don't uh, use it. Uh, just prepare your own work and then you can compare. Okay, so you can compare it. Well, I don't, I, I, personally, I've never paid anybody from any university to compare their work with. <laughs> Alright? There's plenty of smart people around here. There's plenty of really, really intelligent people. Uh, people in this room right now that you can compare work with. You don't need to go to Cambridge. All right? Are you really ready to become a professional? All right, so we've gone through all of these bits. I'll summarize and I'll leave you with a thought. So there are three worlds of ethics included in major decisions. That's what I've argued today. Codes of conduct are based on multiple philosophical theories that, uh, that interact in professional, organizational, and scientific communities in order to, one, define the professional, and two, specify the most appropriate course of action in difficult decisions. And we've looked at some of those decisions today. This is an interesting one, and I'd just like to finish um, because I know that uh, there's a philosopher in the room. I don't know if you know uh, uh, Billy, William McMurtry, Dr. McMurtry. He studied Spinoza. I didn't mention Spinoza, uh, but he's also a major and important philosopher. I would put him in the emotions area. There's no single thing in nature than which there is not another more powerful and stronger. Whatever power one is given, there is another more powerful by which the first can be destroyed. Are you really the best? Do you really have that power that you believe you have? I hope the answer is yes. And finally, how's your story going in? Thank you very much, guys. If you, if you have any questions, we, if you have any questions, we have a few minutes left. Yeah. Uh, how do you define the word professional? For example, I don't think that Gutenberg is not a professional in terms of uh, ruling the country because uh, professional, he's a professional ruling the country, but he's not a professional in terms of academia. So how do you define the? That's a good question. So the question was basically, he's a professional because he can do his job. He can be a defense minister, but he's not a professional according to academia. But the fact is that whether he believes he's a professional or not, it's not his decision. It's the decision of the, the secular world of large organizations. And the secular world of large organizations says, if you want to be a professional, you have to have a degree. 
And so he yeah. said, he agreed to that, and he went and completed his doctorate degree. But he didn't really complete it. He cheated on it. So how can you say he's a professional? Because you might say he's a professional, but that's you. The world says something different, and now he's had to face the consequences based on his actions, unprofessional actions of plagiarism. Okay, other questions? Has everybody got good notes? Don't you think that it's just a group of jealous people who want to, who want to try to destroy this uh, guy? Uh, maybe because no one paid attention to his uh, doctoral thesis before he became a minister of defense and so on. And so that's on. a good. That's that's a good point. And that's why we need to pay attention to the idea of power. No matter how powerful you think you are, somebody's going to find a weakness in you. Somebody will find it. But if you're morally strong, there's a lot less opportunities for people to uh, break you down. Yeah. Okay? Those are very good questions. Thank you very much. Anything else? Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time. Oh, yeah.